everyone and welcome. Um, thanks for coming out today. I know this is a busy time of semester, so I'm super pleased <coughs> to see uh, as many of you here as are here. Um, I'm Jessica Berman. I'm professor of English and director of the Drescher Center for the Humanities. Um, and this is a, a Drescher Center sponsored event, but we also want to thank our fellow sponsors, the Gender, Women's, and Sexuality Studies Department, the Information Systems Department, the Biological Sciences Department, the Philosophy Department, and the Office of Accessibility and Disability. Um, and I want to just take this moment also to thank Courtney Hobson, who is the mastermind behind the Humanities Forum, has been working hard behind the scenes all year. Um, she's coordinator in the Drescher Center. So Courtney, could you just stand up for a minute and get a little um, This talk is part of the Humanities Forum series, and we're in the middle of planning for a great season next year. So I want to encourage you to keep your eye on our website, dressercenter.umbc.edu. Um, and you can also engage with us on social media. Follow the Dresser Center for the Humanities on Facebook and at UMBC Humanities on Twitter, which is Courtney's domain. And uh, so you'll find her tweets. Um, our final event is coming up on Wednesday, May 8th. 4 p.m. right here in the library gallery. Uh, we'll present the annual Lippitz Lecture, Seeing the Unseen Landscape, a talk by Dan Bailey, professor of visual arts at UMBC. Um, and in this talk, uh, Professor Bailey will consider human scale perception and natural landscape, which are central to his current work on long duration photography of landscapes and a reconstruction of Baltimore's geographic past. Uh, he's th looking at two seemingly disparate projects one called Slow Exposure and another called Early Baltimore. Um, both encourage us to examine the meanings of viewpoint, focused versus fuzzy, and how the long view can be used to augment thinly sliced data. So come back. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Rosemary Garland Thompson, who is a teacher, bioethicist, and humanities scholar and one of our most important thought leaders in the fields of disability culture and justice today. She's a professor of English and bioethics at Emory University where she teaches disability studies, bioethics, American literature and culture, and feminist theory. Her work has been crucial in imagining and developing the field of critical disability studies and in bringing forward the importance of disability identity, inclusion, and access in our contemporary world. Uh, one look at Rosemary Garland Thompson's books, as well as her other publications, shows why she is credited as one of the founders of and key figures in critical disability studies. In 1995, her first book, Freakery, Cultural Spectacles of the Extraordinary Body, collected essays exploring from a variety of dimensions America's fascination with the visually different. Her introduction traces the freak show from antiquity to the modern period, showing us what characterizes the category of the freak and why it is politically and culturally significant. In the following year, she published Extraordinary <coughs> Bodies, Figuring Physical Disability in American Culture and Literature, a, ground a groundbreaking book that set the stage for much of the work that was to come in the field. It was the first major study to examine literary and cultural representations of physical disability, situating disability as a social construction rather than a biological category. It shifted disability from something we consider to be a property of bodies themselves to disability as a product of the cultural rules that tell us what bodies should be and do. In the book, Garland Thompson looks at disabled figures in novels such as Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin and several works by Toni Morrison and creates critical disability studies by framing disability as a minority discourse rather than a medical one. Her more recent 2009 book, Staring How We Look, uses examples from art, media, fashion, history, and memoir to explore the meaning of how and why we stare. She borrows from psychology and biology to help explain why the impulse to stare is so powerful, but also shows how examples from the realm of imaginative culture help us understand what motivates staring, who become targets, 
and what effects staring causes. Garland Thompson has also been active in making the broader case for the importance of disability um, and disability studies in the academy and beyond. She co-directed a National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Institute on Disability Studies in 2000, which shaped the development of many scholars who now lead the field, and was a founding member and co-chair for two years of the Modern Language Association's Committee on Disability Issues in the Profession, which transformed the, MLA's, the MLA into a model of accessibility for organizations across the world. She established the field of feminist disability studies with seminal and definitional articles in feminist studies journals, um, and also um, uh, um, had articles that were reprinted in various feminist textbooks, establishing a canon of feminist disability studies and agenda for future scholarship. Her 2016 editorial, which some of you may have seen, Becoming Disabled, was the inaugural article in the ongoing weekly series in the New York Times about disability by people living with disabilities. She's the co-editor of About Us, Essays from the New York Times about Disabilities by People with Disabilities, which is forthcoming. She's also engaged with scientists and other health professionals surrounding the debate on such bioethical topics as gene editing via CRISPR. Her current project, is Embracing Our Humanity, a Bioethics of Disability and Health. In her wonderful essay, The Story of My Work, How I Became Disabled, which appears in Disability Studies Quarterly, Garland Thompson characterizes her work as pushing towards, quote, a reparative reading of disability, identity, and culture, the kind of reading that is characterized by pleasure, positivity, and generosity, and that recognizes resourcefulness, creativity, and persistence, the persistence of disability in the world and those who inhabit it. I can think of no better way to describe her as a scholar, resourceful, positive, generous, and persistent, and I'm delighted to welcome her to UMBC today. Jessica, thank you very much for that really generous and eloquent um, introduction um, and humbling. Um, I'm delighted to be here at the Humanities Forum uh, to uh, share some work with you all. And um, I want to thank, of course, you, Jessica, for organizing this and for inviting me, for Courtney Hobson for organizing the event, and for you all for coming at five o'clock in the afternoon. So, um, and there's plenty of food, I think, or there was plenty of food. Feel free to do what you need to do to make yourself comfortable at this time of the day. I think you took my papers. <laughs> that was a bad move. Didn't realize they were there. I did indeed. Thank you. So my talk today is called Building a World That Includes Disability. And I'm going to begin by what is in many ways the central claim of critical disability studies. And this comes from the disability historian Douglas Bainton who says, disability is everywhere once you know how to look for it. And today together, I'm hoping that we can look for and find disability together. So I'm going to begin with the idea of disability itself, with some definitions that I've come up with over the years in thinking and talking about disability, about what disability is. So first, these are my definitions. The human variations we think of as disabilities are part of the human condition and they occur in every life and family and are a theme in all art and culture. And I'm showing an image of an Egyptian family from Giza in which one of the family members is a person of short stature. Another definition, and this is my more poetic definition because 
I'm an English professor. Disability is a record written on the body of our encounters between the flesh and the world. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And I want to suggest that the way I define disability here counters a medical definition of disability. It counters the idea that the human variations we think of as disabilities are inherent pathological characteristics or human biological lack. And so what I want to do is to suggest a much more cultural understanding of what it means to have the human variations that we think of as disabilities and what disability makes in the world. And I wanted to call attention to the mode of presentation that I'm uh, using today. <clears throat> and that is, I'm presenting um, what I call multiple communication formats in order to create as comprehensive and accessible environment in here as I possibly can. So you have several formats of communication operating at the same time. Uh, one is my is the auditory portion, so I'm speaking, um, and that is an accessible uh, format for some people. I'm also showing um, a textual version of some of the information that I'm presenting, and I'm also uh, giving you a presentation of um, imagistic presentation that goes along with this presentation. And today we, we also have a gestural form of communication and that is um, American Sign Language Interpretation. So we have an auditory, a textual, an imagistic, and a gestural format of communication which creates as robust and accessible environment as we possibly can. And I'm showing here uh, two images. They're portraits of people with disabilities, and I'll talk a little bit about one of them. But this is a portrait of a woman named Shayla who has burn scarring on her face, and another portrait, a self-portrait by Vincent Van Gogh of himself with a bandaged ear. Another definition of disability. The lived experience of disability gives people and communities opportunities for expression, creativity, resourcefulness, relationships, and flourishing. In other words, what I want to focus on with you today is what is the, what the generative um, opportunities are, what the generative aspects of disability might be. In other words, what disability makes in the world. So where do we find disability if it's everywhere? Well, we find it in the cultural archive, the human record. We find disability in systems of representation that we call literature, dance, art, and design. And I'll be focusing on those three genres of objects and representation um, during our time together here this afternoon. It's important to understand that in this human record, disability crosses all genre, all media, time periods, aesthetics, themes, and cultures. And this is what I'm going to try to present to you today is the pervasiveness of disability across time and across space. So what does finding disability do once we know how to find it? Let me offer some ideas. Finding disability, I want to suggest, is an opportunity to explore, to redefine, and to make new stories about what it means to be human. And I'm showing an image here that I'll come back to. And it's a painting by the artist Catherine Sherwood, who's a woman with a disability, who uses her own brain images to replace the face in famous paintings. And this is a painting of Manet's Olympia that she has redefined with um, images for the face and a fashionable brace on the leg. So finding disability helps us understand how communities make 
and unmake the human variations that we think of as disabilities. So disability, we can say, is something that is produced by life activities, by encounters, as I suggested, between bodies and world. Technologies such as war, um, industrialization, medicine, activities of life make and unmake disabilities. So we also will find, and this is what I'm going to do with you today, the tradition of disability as an aesthetic and a narrative resource. And I'm going to show you uh, examples of this for the rest of my presentation here today. So first let me begin with literature and media arts in where we find disability. So we find disability everywhere, as I've suggested. The founding narrative of Western culture is Oedipus the King by so Sophocles. And the story of Oedipus is bookended by disability. It begins with his broken foot, uh, which is what identifies him in the narrative. And the story of Oedipus, of course, ends with his gouging out his own eyes, making himself blind as a kind of representation of the knowledge that he has about his own identity. And I'm showing an image here from 1896, uh, uh, yeah, 96, which I think is very dramatic, of um, the uh, actor Albert Grenier uh, tearing at his clothes and blood running down his face from um, his own self-blinding. And this, of course, carries on the tradition of the blind seer that we have in classical literature, uh, figures such as uh, Tiresias. So there's also a vibrant, a vibrant uh, literature, which um, Jessica mentioned that I'm really quite fascinated with, and that is the literature of monstrosity and, more recently, freaks, hybrid creatures, which pull together uh, humans and other animal forms. We see this very often in fantasy and science fiction. Uh, some examples from literature might be, of course, the figure of Frankenstein, this hybrid creature, Caliban from The Tempest, as well as um, Joseph Merrick, the elephant man, known as the elephant man, who was a man with um, a serious medical condition, who um, was a performer. Um, and there's a really wonderful play. We find disability in the sentimental tradition in the 19th century, especially where illness is thought to offer, illness and disability are thought to offer redemptive power. We see this in uh, the figure of Eva in Uncle Tom's Cabin, the uh, young girl with, the, with uh, tuberculosis who redeems figures uh, within the novel. And of course, in Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, where we have the virtuous little crippled boy, Tiny Tim. The classics of American literature, of course, feature disability. Moby Dick by Herman Melville and The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner, understood as the most important 19th and 20th century novels. Both have significant, uh, I mean, the, the main characters, the protagonists are um, figures with, uh, are characters with disabilities. We have Captain Ahab, the amputee in Moby Dick, and Benji Compson, the man with a developmental disability in The Sound and the Fury. We also have, of course, our own writers and poets. And I'm showing you an image here of Paul Guest, a very well-known poet. I call him, with his permission, a mouth stick poet. He is a man with uh, quadriplegia, and so he uses a power wheelchair. And when he reads his poetry aloud to audiences, he uses a mouth stick to swipe through his poetry, which is displayed on his phone, sitting on his power wheelchair. And it gives his poetry a very distinctive cadence as he moves the mouth stick back and forth in his mouth when he swipes and reads his poetry aloud. It's really a beautiful performance. In popular media, we have a whole range of disabled artists, um, for example, Maison Zaid is one of several um, 
comedians with uh, cerebral palsy. And part of her shtick, if you will, is that she is a sit-down stand-up comedian. Um, and she uh, talks a lot about how cerebral palsy uh, inflects her way of life and her form of comedy. She's great. This is a picture of her giving her TED Talk in 2013. If you have a chance to take a look at it, I think you'll appreciate it. We have reality television shows with people with disabilities. This is called Push Girls. And I'm showing an image of the four kind of fashion model -y, wheelchair using women who are actual women with disabilities who use wheelchairs that are in uh, Push Girls, which is a Sundance TV reality show. Uh, of course, um, the very well-known figure, Peter Dinklage, who is one of the most important characters in the HBO's wildly popular and enduring Game of Thrones. Um, and I'm showing him here at, in his character in Game of Thrones, but also as a cover guy in, uh, on the front cover of Esquire, looking very dapper and, and really quite sexy. Maureen Dowd, who wrote a great article about him, um, who's a columnist for the Washington Post, um, and I think for the New York Times often as well, called him our first dwarf heartthrob, which I think is accurate. Many short independent films feature disability. This is just one example. Uh, this is a film about Rachel Kolb, who is a oral deaf sign language using woman in which she speaks for about six minutes here um, using sign language as well, talking about how she uses lip reading in communication. I'm going to talk next about dance and other forms of gestural narrative, particularly uh, dance, to give you an idea of how robust the uh, field of disability dance has uh, become over the last several years. So to begin, here is an image of a group called, the, called Five Foot Feet. This is a company of three people. And two of the people dance on two legs, and one of the persons, Catherine Cole, in the front of this image, dances on one leg. Uh, thus, they have the pun five foot feet, F-E-A-T, but of course it could be F-E-E-T as well, because there are five feet. Leroy Moore, who I'm showing here, is a poet and is a creator of what is called Crip Hop as opposed to hip hop. It's a movement that he founded. He is a dancer uh, and a performer with cerebral palsy. So his crip hop format, much like um, Maison Zaid's, is very distinctive and it comports with the bodily movements that are distinctive to him as a person with cerebral palsy. This is an image of a man, a dancer called Bill Shannon, who goes by the um, stage name Crutch Man. He is a crutch user who has fashioned crutches with rockers on the bottom of those in order to perform break dancing. So he again has innovated a movement vocabulary distinctive to his own form of embodiment and the equipment, the technologies that he uses. So his mobility technologies become, in his breakdancing work, aesthetic technologies. And this is something I'll talk a little bit more about later. So there, uh, here's an image of Claire Cunningham, who is a dancer from the UK. Uh, she's in a program here uh, in 2012 called Unlimited UK. She uses here a different kind of crutch. They are uh, Canadian, called Canadian crutches or arm crutches. She's using five of them, one on her ankle, two on each forearm, and one around her neck in order to introduce, again, new technologies um, into the work of contemporary dance, again, that are distinctive to both the environment and the embodiment of people with disabilities. There are two dancers I'm showing here. Uh, one is Homer Avila on the right, uh, the late Homer Avila, who 
in the midst of a career, successful career as a dancer, uh, primarily a modern dancer and a ballet dancer, um, he became a one-legged dancer and developed an entire new, again, vocabulary movement, a lot of floor work uh, for his own performances as a result of becoming a one-legged dancer. On the left, I'm showing an image, and I just love this image. It is um, a picture of David Toole, who is a legless dancer. And he is standing, or I guess standing, he is <laughs> um, on one arm, uh, with one arm lifted up behind him, and he wears a skirt, which is much like a fan, designed for him by Alexander McQueen, the late um, English uh, fashion designer. And David Toole is a legless dancer, and what this introduces uh, to contemporary dance is a whole, again, new vocabulary of movement, but also calls into question what the essence of dance might be, because we imagine that dance is something that is always performed on legs. So a legless dancer introduces new concepts and brings the art form of contemporary dance forward in fresh ways. Uh, this is an image of Alice Shepard and Laurel Lawson in their performance uh, of the company in the company called Kinetic Light from 2017. And this is a a uh, particularly uh, impressive performance in which these two wheelchair users press really forward the definition of virtuosity by the movements that are possible by the use, through the use of wheelchairs as part of the aesthetic technology of contemporary dance. It's been said that the wheelchair introduced new possibilities into contemporary dance that had not been introduced since the ballet shoe. In terms of gestural movement, um, I wanted to share with you um, some images from the Frankenstein Ballet that was performed in 2017 in London and in San Francisco. And I saw this ballet. It's available on DVD from the uh, London performance if you're interested in ballet. It's really uh, quite a remarkable adaptation and I've been doing some writing and presenting on the ballet um, in which we have an opportunity to present um, some of the characteristics that we think of as disability, creatureliness of course, uh, through gestural forms and through appearance. And so the uh, movements and the costuming in this ballet are particularly interesting. And I'm showing here an image uh, at the end in which um, we have Victor Frankenstein and the creature that he has created in a really very powerful pas de deux that blends ballet pas de deux movements along with contemporary um, uh, movement vocabulary from uh, modern dance uh, in which creator and creation struggle uh, to the death, actually, uh, at the end of the ballet. So I'd like to move on to art and design and to show you some ways that we find disability in art and design. So we find disability first, I want to suggest, as a subject of art. For example, I'm showing a painting called The Cripples from 1568 in which Peter Bruegel shows some men with their prosthetic devices, their homemade crutches out and about in the public world. A scene here on a vase from the Greek classical era in which a man of small stature is painted on the front of the vase. We have a long tradition of disability in protest art. This is a painting called Gassed from 1918, which is a protest against the gassing of uh, soldiers in World War I, and it's painted by John Singer Sargent. It's a row of uh, blind soldiers who are walking, marching along, uh, each of them with his hand on the soldier in front of him. A more positive uh, rendition of blind people comes from Jacob Lawrence in this Harlem Renaissance 
painting uh, of the high life in Harlem during, um, as I said, in 1938, during the high Harlem Renaissance. This is called Blind Beggars, and we have these natalie dressed blind beggars going up and down the street with the children surrounding them in a kind of parade, whooping and hollering and having a grand time. People looking out the window, hanging out the window, looking at them. It's a wonderful painting. It's in the Met in New York, if you have a chance to see it. We also find disability shaping art. So artists, of course, like all people, um, have acquire disabilities or have disabilities and very often those disabilities inflect the art that they produce. So I'm showing you here two images of course by the famous painter Frida Kahlo who had significant disabilities and painted those disabilities into her self-portraits but also understood her disabilities as affecting her understanding of art and self-representation. The painting again here, the self-portrait by Vincent van Gogh, uh, self-portrait with a bandaged ear in which he presents himself as a person with a disability. Many of the late works of artists are inflected by their own uh, acquisition of disability. Here is a painting from the Water Lily series. It's a late work by the French artist, Impressionist artist Claude Monet, who grew increasingly blind uh, during his late years, as many people do. And the more blind he got, the more fuzzy, the more impressionistic his representations of uh, the world, the natural world, became. And I'm also showing here a picture of his glasses, uh, which I think is quite wonderful. It was um, in a display of some of his work that I saw. We have um, a self-representation here, a sculpture of a cast of a body of a woman with a mastectomy. This is um, Nancy Freed. It's Torso with Hands on Hips from 1994. This is part of a very vibrant uh, collection of uh, self-representation of women with mastectomies, that form of disability, which is part of the breast cancer movement and part of the vibrant work over the last 30 or 40 years in um, women's self-representation, uh, at least in the US and the Western world. We also find disability as a concept in art. This is a sketch. Whoop. This is a sketch by the artist uh, Neil Marcus, who is a man with paralysis. And it's a sketch of someone riding on a wheelchair. Christine Sun Kim, who is a sound artist. Uh, she is a deaf sign language using sound artist who explores in her work, the, rep the relationship between sound and deafness. And this is really important work if you have an opportunity to um, look at some of her work. Because of course one of the assumptions about deafness is that people who are deaf have no relationship to sound. So being a sound artist is um, a very interesting way for her to explore that relationship. Again, this is Catherine Sherwood's painting called Olympia, which is a re-narration of um, Edward Manet's Olympia, uh, imposing the um, leg brace and the um, MRI face that came from Catherine Sherwood's own experience of um, becoming paralyzed uh, in mid-career and learning to do art all over again with a different hand. This is a piece by Jessie Park, a woman with autism, in which she uh, presents what might be called autistic art. In other words, the world as Jessie Park experiences it, a person with autism. We also find disability in unintentional ways in art, in particular in uh, modern art and in surrealist art. Uh, here in early cubism we find in Pablo Picasso's uh, Woman in the Blue Hat, very famous painting, um, 
a questioning of or a representation of asymmetry. And of course, asymmetry is, or violations of symmetry, especially bilateral symmetry, uh, is one of the characteristics that we understand uh, to be a characteristic of disability. I'm showing you an image here of Judith Scott, a very well-known, uh, late now, um, sculpture artist. She is, was a woman uh, with Down syndrome who was deaf, who began rapping. Um, in other words, she did fiber sculpture uh, early on and continued uh, through her whole life to produce a remarkable body of work. And this is one example from uh, 2004 that was displayed in an art exhibit, but the Brooklyn Museum also did a solo exhibit of her work. And she has, again, wrapped here a chair and put a wheel from a wheelchair or a bicycle, I'm not sure which, um, in part of this uh, sculpture. It's a really beautiful piece. Um, I want to move into objects that are designed objects now and talk a little bit about them to transition from aesthetic objects to uh, util uh, useful objects or objects that we, um, that we use. This is a wonderful collection of canes that were presented to Franklin Roosevelt, who was um, our president during World War II and before, who um, had had polio and was uh, used a wheelchair every day of his life, but never presented himself to the public in a wheelchair. And um, he was given, however, by heads of state, every time he went to visit or when they came to visit him, a cane. And these are collected here at Warm Springs. This is an example of art designed by people with disabilities. The artist Sandy Yee, who has very unusually shaped feet, designed shoes for herself in which a horn goes between her two toes. There are many prosthetics that are being designed to be shown. Uh, this is an aesthetic prosthetic, so they look like objects of art instead of medical devices. Uh, this is from the Alternative Limb Project, a beautiful uh, prosthetic leg that, that is encrusted with jewels and designs, organic designs. Here is an Ames-inspired prosthetic leg, and this man um, has a suit on with uh, short pants so as to display this leg. And you can see that the design was um, inspired by the famous Ames chair of mid-century modern design. This is the MIT engineer Hugh Hare, who has designed prosthetic legs which actually are more functional than um, fleshly legs. So his argument is, and it's been shown, that the legs that he designs, he's a double amputee, uh, actually are more functional and more efficient, especially in running and walking, than um, actual legs of flesh. So I'd like to end with um, accessible design and give you some ideas of how objects designed for the purposes of access have made the world more accessible and more usable for all of us. So access is everywhere, I want to suggest, as I did, as Doug Bainton did, once you know how to look for it. So I'm showing you here, of course, the symbols of access that guide us all to accessible pathways and accessible environments through which we use the world all together. The older sign from 1968 that is a more stable, static kind of figure, and then the more dynamic figure from 2010 in which we have the wheelchair user leaning forward um, in a position of self-determination. And this is a post-ADA, post-Americans with Disabilities, understanding of disability. Here is Kathy D. Woods. She is a designer. She is a person of small stature designing clothes for small adults. Uh, this is uh, a prosthetic leg that is being held up. It's made with an iPad and a 3D printer, so you can make your own prosthetic leg if you need to. Here is an example of a designed chair by Wendy Jacob. It's called a squeeze chair, which is often very helpful for people with disabilities who appreciate uh, pressure 
on their bodies and this chair uh, is able to give these people um, a self-guided um, squeeze. Here is an example of a tactile watch that blind people often use. It's a really beautiful design that where time is then um, available to us through touch. This is a picture of actually me using uh, an iPad um, because I don't keyboard uh, because of my own uh, disability. And so I talk to my machines in order to produce text. I use talk to text or I use dictation. And it has made it possible for me to do my work in the world. So that little button with the microphone on it that is on our phones and on our iPads has made everything work much better for me in the digital burden of, um, that we all have now. Um, video telephoning or video communication has made it much more efficient for people who use sign language to communicate with each other through video. Um, video signing, and I'm showing an image here of a woman signing on uh, the screen of her iPhone. Of course, wheelchairs have become have transitioned from being medical devices into being um, fashion devices or mobility devices. I'm showing a uh, handsome wheelchair, the kind that we all, many of us use at the airport, as well as uh, a walker that gives many people um, a, a new independence and mobility that the old medical wheelchairs were not able to provide. And of course, this is because the entire public space, the public world, as a result of the disability rights legislation that required accessible environments to be built, has been changed so that wheeled vehicles now are available for all of us to use um, out in the public sphere. So I'm showing you here an image of a uh, what I call these SUV wheelchair um, SUV strollers. This is a family uh, with three children, um, and they are all piled on this stroller, which is enormous and is only possible for families to use because of the curb cuts and the ramps that exist now in the public sphere. Um, public transportation, of course, has become accessible. I'm showing you here a picture of a subway car and <clears throat> the platform that um, has tactile paving on it uh, and also that meets the, uh, the um, door to the subway car with no change in elevation so that wheeled vehicles of all kinds from bicycles to those enormous strollers to a wheelchair to a skateboard can to our rolling suitcases can move in and out of these um, cars uh, with ease and it's changed again uh, transportation entirely i'm showing you a crowded subway car here with a woman with a double stroller um, and children so the ramping um, and the accessibility of the built environment is extremely important in being able, uh, in providing people who care for people who don't walk, uh, whether they're older people or whether they're children or people simply who don't walk at all, to have access to the public sphere in a way that they never could before um, as caretakers. <clears throat> I'm showing here, of course, the transition that ramps have um, undertaken since 1968 when the Architectural Barriers Act said that public buildings uh, that received any kind of government funding uh, needed to be made accessible to people with disabilities. No one had any idea what that meant at the time. So ugly ramps were strapped onto the front of buildings and it was thought to ruin a building to put a ramp on it. Now, of course, architects and designers have come up with ramps that are aesthetically beautiful and extremely effective. This is a ramp in the center of the Ed Roberts campus in Berkeley, uh, California, and it's a beautiful uh, helical 
red ramp that is the very centerpiece of this important building. And I'm also showing you an older ramp, not intended for access, but um, in the Guggenheim Museum in New York, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright at the end of his life, I might add. Here is an emergency vehicle. It's a wheeled vehicle for stairs in the Library of Congress. And I think this is very interesting because um, one of the biggest design challenges is making historic buildings be accessible to people with disabilities. And so architects and historic preservationists have come up with all sorts of really innovative designs. And I thought that this emergency stair climbing wheelchair was a particularly interesting um, solution to um, making uh, equality and emergency preparation uh, between wheelchair users and um, leg walkers. Portable ramps now are available. This is a picture of a, a historic home that has a few steps up to the front door and these small inexpensive portable lightweight ramps make homes and other places visitable. That is to say someone with a wheelchair uh, or someone who needs a ramp in order to get into the building uh, can use and visit these um, historic places with a lot more efficiency than, um, than, well, in a way that they were kept out in the past. I love this. So this is an accessible bidet toilet. It is a to an example of a toilet that is a hands-free toilet, um, which uh, makes it possible for uh, people who need hands-free toileting to have some independence um, when they're out and about in the public world or in their own homes uh, through this um, bidet toilet, which is very similar to what we think of as uh, some of the toilets that many of you may have seen in the Far East. They're pretty swell. Single-use restrooms have changed the, again, toileting uh, and personal care environment. Here is a sign of a, a single-use restroom that can be used for multiple purposes by multiple numbers of people for multiple purposes. My point here in talking about accessible design, especially in the public sphere, has is really the most important point that I think I'm making here, and that is that accessible design has changed who we think we share our world with and who we, in fact, do share our world with. And that's because a wide range of people who were excluded from the public environment now can use the public space in new ways. So we're at about 6.20. Are we supposed to go for another 10 or 15 minutes? OK, good. Thank you. So my point here is that disability access is access for everybody. In other words, the presence of disability as a concept of people with disabilities in the world of things that people with disabilities make and that are made for people with disabilities to use make a better world for all of us to use. So I'm going to end by suggesting what can an ethics, this is what I call it, what can an ethics of disability inclusion do? And I have an ambitious set of accomplishments and aspirations for an ethics of disability inclusion. And I want to suggest that access, and I wanted to make sure that I use a lot of these important vocabulary words for us here, that what access does is that it creates inclusion and it creates diversity. In other words, it makes it possible for people who have been excluded from spaces activities and events to use the world in new ways to be included in a world that might have excluded them in the past and this increases the diversity in our communities and in our public spaces. So in ethics of disability inclusion I want to suggest 
will strengthen support for disability culture, for the presence of people with disabilities, and for awareness about disability across all civic institutions. A disability inclusion and narrative uh, initiative, I'm sorry, will also develop practices that implement disability inclusion, diversity, and disability justice. An ethics of disability inclusion and access will build this inclusive environment, to which I've been referring, that supports all human embodied flourishing. And I'm showing here an image that I really like. It's a picture of two people on a bus. Uh, one is a wheelchair user and he's reading his book and one is a woman talking on her phone and they are both in accessible spaces on public transportation together. An ethics of disability inclusion needs to and will shape environments to fit human beings rather than shape human beings to fit environments. It will promote the development of bioethical, cultural, technological, and legal supports for people living with disabilities as we are. So we need an infrastructure, a sustainable environment for all people but for people with disabilities in order to flourish. And the result will be, I want to submit, that attitudes will change, access will increase, community will be built, and leadership can be cultivated. And I'm showing here an image from 2015 at the White House in the United States, uh, Capitol, just down the street here, uh, in which there was an enormous celebration for the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And there was a reception at the White House, and um, Barack Obama, the president, of course, gave um, a, a talk uh, welcoming all of us who had come to Washington, D.C to uh, celebrate the Americans with Disabilities Act. And my friend, Haben Girma, who I'm showing here, was chosen to introduce Barack Obama. And Haben Girma is a first-generation uh, Eritrean uh, immigrant to the United States. She was born in the United States, but her parents were born in Eritrea. And she is the first deaf-blind person to graduate from uh, Harvard Law School. And what was really wonderful about this is that, of course, it had never occurred to Barack Obama or maybe anybody else uh, who is a leader in the United States or many other people that there were deafblind people in the world, let alone deafblind people who would go to Harvard Law School. And you could see on President Obama's face when he was interacting with Haben Girma, um, how fascinated he was with the way she navigated and operated in the world. She uses um, a suite of technologies ranging from a um, service animal, um, a German shepherd named Maxine, to a device, I don't even know quite what it's called, in which she types in things and people uh, sit on the other side and they type in things. So when someone, when President Obama typed to Haben, she was able to access that uh, through a braille reader. Uh, plus she uses small microphones because she does um, use hearing a little bit. Um, and it was a really wonderful experience to see how transformed he was by seeing how she used technology so expertly to, to be in and to work with her world. So thank you. Oh, good. So please do go ahead and, and field your own questions. And if you can speak up when you um, when you talk, that would be great so everyone can hear you. 
Yes, and I'll repeat the questions um, because I have a microphone here and that's always a good uh, practice so we have a robust auditory environment. Please. Uh, could you clarify what you mean by uh, medical versus the word you used? Uh, cultural? Cultural definitions of disability and what, what are the, the main differences in the positive and the positives that you see in the cultural definition as opposed to the medical definition. Because uh, uh, I'm only used to medical definitions for the disabilities I have, and I don't under quite understand what you're talking about. Yes, thank you. The question is um, to for me to clarify what I mean by uh, the distinction between a medical understanding of disability and a uh, cultural understanding of disability. So a medical understanding of disability uh, is an interpretation of bodily variation in which many variations, traits that we think of as disabilities are pathologies. They are medical conditions to be diagnosed, to be treated, uh, and prognosis narratives to be developed. And of course it's very important for any human being to have access to good medical care and medical treatment. So the reason that this medical understanding of disability has certain limitations is that it has been the dominant understanding of disability. And what it does is that it forces us to think about and to consider disabilities and people with disabilities as sick and in need of curing and transformation. So a cultural understanding of disability would suggest that these human variations that we think of as disease, illness, disability have always been part of the human experience and that people have developed a culture and have contributed to culture building and have flourished um, as people with disabilities and that they have produced a distinctive culture and contributed to the general <coughs> culture in part through and because of these human qualities that we think of as disabilities. Does that help? I'm still not quite sure what you mean by uh, how you use curing and such. Because it seems to have, there's a, there's a negative aspect that you're talking about. Uh, and I just want to make sure I properly understand. I would not want to suggest that uh, curing is an improper um, goal for people with disabilities. I think it's much more effective to think about medical treatment. So, as I suggested, all people um, have the need for and need to be able to access good medical treatment and health care. And part of medical treatment and health care for everybody, whether these are whether we identify as disabled or identify as non-disabled, should be available to everyone. <laughs> Part of disability culture is to suggest that there are positive aspects of some of the human variations that we think of as disabilities. And I suggested that, I think, with, uh, say, some of the dancers that I um, introduced you to in my slides. So. For example, let's take Alice Shepard, the wheelchair-using dancer. She makes art through a body understood as disabled, a body that uses a wheelchair. She's not interested in having her medical condition cured so that she doesn't need to use a wheelchair anymore. She gets medical treatment in the same way that anyone would get medical treatment, but her goal is not to stop using a wheelchair and start walking for mobility. So this is somewhat distinct from what we might think of as a traditional medical aspiration, and that is to cure 
something so that a person doesn't need to use a wheelchair anymore. So is that example helpful? We can talk more about this. Thank you. Other question? Kanta, thank you. My colleague and friend Kanta is here. <laughs> um, so um, I have two different things to say. Um, one, I appreciated the way in which you structured um, what you were sharing for us about positioning disability already as being inside of the world that we live in. Disability is inside the world that we live in, exactly. Live in but I also heard, I think, something else, which is this call for building an ethics of disability inclusion and a reference to the question of infrastructure. So I saw your, I saw your gestures toward the arts, design, and education, for example, as gestures toward infrastructure. Um, I wonder if you might be able to share your thinking about emerging infrastructure, new places that this work of building an ethics of disability inclusion is going. Kanta's asking um, for my thoughts about where new infrastructure um, to support uh, inclusion um, is going. And I think I suggested some of it. I think some of the most interesting um, work that's being done is to develop, as I said, um, aesthetically um, well, aesthetically effective design solutions for making spaces accessible and to also in those designs invite a wide usage of these um, technologies. So a ramp is simply one example of this. As I suggested, ramps were understood when they first were mandated. Uh, as something only people with disabilities used. Um, and they were for people with disabilities. And as I suggested, they were understood as ruining the value of any building that they were fastened onto. But um, ramps have been integrated into design in aesthetically um, and structurally um, effective ways. And they are widely used by everyone. Um, I call attention in particular, I didn't mention this too much, to rolling suitcases. Rolling suitcases were invented and began to be marketed uh, around the mid-1980s, which was just about the time that public spaces had effective ramping, that curb cuts were put in, that ramps were built into sidewalks and public buildings, um, and that public transportation started being made more accessible, in other words, for wheeled vehicles. And suddenly, we could all have rolling suitcases. And the same thing with the strollers. Uh, so that's one example. I think the other example is um, all sorts of access forms that benefit um, all people, for example, description, uh, which is sometimes called visual description, it's descriptions of images. So a textual or a narrative description of an image, um, which has been understood generally as, a, um, as something that was for blind people. So you go to a museum and you could get a special tour where the docent would describe the works of art. Um, but now, of course, description is becoming more robust and is available for all sorts of uh, images, uh, narrative images. Um, for example, a friend of mine has begun a crowdsourced description service, or description uh, blog, I guess. It's called You Describe. 
So it's like Wikipedia in which peop anybody can describe YouTube videos because YouTube videos are not described, which means that they are inaccessible to uh, blind and um, mm -hmm. uh, partially blind people. But of course, what we know is that description makes an image more accessible for anybody, whether they're blind or sighted. Just as we all know that captioning <laughs> uh, helps everyone um, whether they're deaf or hearing, to understand better films and YouTube videos. And captioning, of course, has become very widely available. So it's those kinds of accessible environments for everyone to use that I think is uh, the most important emerging technology. And one of the things is we don't quite notice it. Like when we, s all of us, watch something that's captioned, we're not thinking, oh, gosh, that's just for deaf people. And isn't it great that deaf people can see this movie and benefit from it? We're just watching the movie like everybody else. And the captioning is there for us, just like a curb cut is there for us in our rolling suitcases, all of us. Any other questions? Thank I'm you. Not, I'm not sure that I can articulate it perfectly, but I understand what your research has been and continues to be, and it's really interesting. And I might sum it up saying that as the world seems to be growing in terms of <coughs> tools and techniques where the d disability becomes, I guess I want to say, not disability, but, but anybody can get around better and understand the world better. Do you see a change in how people who have disabilities, who have challenges, are being, I'll say, integrated, socially acceptable? Are you seeing changes? Like, as, as sort of as people can get around better, whatever challenges that they're dealing with, that sort of people as groups are more welcoming, things, people aren't looking at differences in people as much, or that just totally not clear. No, that's absolutely the point. So the question was, is the world more fully integrated now? Yes. Um, and it is. And this is what I was suggesting. Um, as a result of the laws and policy changes beginning in the 1970s, more or less, with um, education inclusion, um, people with disabilities are guaranteed access to an equal and appropriate education. So people with disabilities were simply kept out of education before. Oh, I, I think I met more. I have a niece who is 26. She was born at 23 weeks and has something called spastic hemiplegia cerebral palsy. She's been a good friend of mine all of her life. I think many things have changed. It's also working in the, in the disabilities arena, something I've always done. But to listen to her talk about the social, her social life, and I think one thing with all this inclusion, I think it's lovely, but I sometimes get the sense that some people that, sh that consider her her friend, they're, they're her friend because she can go have coffee with them immediately or whatever the situation is, but in terms of really being her close friend, there's still a distance, she has a, a very interesting, uh, challenging gait. She falls on the ground a lot. Um, so like I sort of say, well, we all feel better because people are, are mixing more. But in reality, once your evening comes or the weekend comes, I'm not really sure that I, that I, that I see that change. Um, you're bringing up a really good point. So I tell a good story because I want to tell the good part of the story. Disability discrimination is still extremely pervasive. But it is much better than it was because your niece is out and about and can, is not locked up in an institution, mm -hmm. for one thing. Uh, people with significant uh, disabilities from birth <coughs> were excluded from everything. Um, very often, uh, kids born with significant disabilities like cerebral palsy, like Down syndrome, uh, it was advised by medical authorities that they be institutionalized. And so they didn't do very well. 
And so it became a self-fulfilling prophecy that congenital disabilities created terrible lives because when people are institutionalized and away from their families and don't have access to education, they don't do very well. Which is not to say that there is not still biases, but the only way that equality and justice can take place is if we have the opportunities, when I say we, I mean all of us, to be together in the various institutions and spaces of the society. So everybody needs to have access to yeah, right. public spaces, to, to communities, religious communities, to education, to voting places, to every place. And I'm not just talking, of course, about people with disabilities, but rather all people who have in the past been excluded on the basis of their identities. So um, racial discrimination, gender discrimination, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, discrimination on the basis of disability is still very pervasive. But the only way that that can be addressed is by equal access to public space and public goods and the structural supports, especially access to economic resources mm -hmm. and educational resources. And so there are many, many challenges that are still in place. Access to good health care for everyone is an enormous uh, justice issue in the United States. But The only way that this can take place is if we are all together in environments working with each other. No, you, you, I, you, I think what you spoke to and discussed here really brings a lot of hope. I, I see, you know, the change in the playing field, that, that everyone has more opportunities to be out and about, engage, interact, and that's huge. So that's lovely. But I just, you know, kind of look at things from case by case and go, oh boy, I don't know. But on the macro schedule, it's, I, I'm very happy I heard what I heard. Thank you. Other questions, comments? One more? Thank you. Um, I actually wanted to hear your take on aesthetic prosthetics things that are strictly aesthetic because I think that it kind of adds another ideal, like another beauty standard, etc. Mm -hmm. that can be a bit problematic, especially if someone has a mastectomy and they have maybe one breast and then they get a prosthetic for that but it doesn't have any actual function. <coughs> so I was wondering like what your... That's a great question about um, aesthetic prosthetics. Uh, or uh, technologies that um, in the past have been understood as medical technologies that now are understood as um, aesthetic technologies but also as, if you will, fashion statements. Um, and I think the most important part of that is that um, or the most liberatory aspect of it, and I, w I suggested that I think with some of the images that I showed, is that there is often um, shame associated with disability and with the use of disability technologies that are medicalized and um, not understood as having any aesthetic benefit. Um, and that it's important for people to be able to imagine um, their technology as being beautiful and enhancing their own social and cultural capital um, in the way that <coughs> non-disabled people's in, 
or the technologies that non-disabled people use are also understood as aesthetic enhancements in some way. Um, I think there's a difference between a, let's say, prosthetic enhancement, prosthetic aesthetic enhancement, oh, that's an <laughs> awkward <laughs> mouthful, and a, um, well, yeah. <coughs> and a technology that is, um, doesn't have any particular utility or one that is normalizing. So you talked about mastectomy uh, prosthetics. So um, I'm sure you're aware that many uh, women with mastectomies refuse uh, prosthetic technologies and there's a whole movement, which is really wonderful, of women displaying their mastectomy scars and a whole movement of tattooing over the uh, mastectomy scars that is uh, part of the whole breast cancer pride movement, if you will. Um, so I think that some of the most interesting uh, aesthetic technologies in the broadest sense are not normalizing, but they are aesthetically pleasing, if that makes any sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>